Hey, thanks so much for joining us for another uh, podcast, video cast of Reaching the Next Generation. And I am absolutely excited to be joined today with John McRae, um, a YouTube guy. What do you mean? Um, what is it? Let's go. Is that? Let's go. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, th- let me give you the background of what we're doing and why this is even a thing. We see, when I talk to pastors, um, I see that they're telling me that church is about 50% back as to what it was before COVID. Even before that, people were leaving, and we were dealing with this group called the nuns and the duns. Um, we have the rise of atheism, and I mean, I know it's not percentage-wise not as big, but we have that going on. In your opinion, based on what you do, being on YouTube, talking to the thousands of people that comment, why do you think people are really leaving the church? What, what, what's g- Give me like, and it doesn't have to be a 10-point list. It could be a two-point list. It could be five. What are reasons that you see people are leaving the church? Yeah, I honestly, what I think from my perspective is that a lot of the times in culture, you have a different set of assumptions that um, you live life based off of. And, you know, you have these different kind of worldviews. And the church, a lot of the time, doesn't connect with those assumptions. So the gospel literally doesn't make sense to a lot of people. You know what I mean? Because they don't see these things. Like, why, why do I need to have a need for a savior? Um, because for them, a lot of the times, like how they know if they're doing something wrong is whether or not they feel bad or not, right? And so if they don't feel bad about it, and this is how I am naturally too, you know, coming out of culture too, you know, it's like, if I don't feel bad about it, I don't think it's wrong. You know what I mean? And it's, sure. if I can justify it in some way, I don't feel like it's wrong. So then you don't really see your need for a savior. So there's there's countless things like that in culture. And I think a reason why the churches are declining a lot in attendance and stuff is because of um, we're not always doing the best job at meeting people where they're at, Mm -hmm. you see? And so just like a good missionary, like Jesus could have dropped the Bible down from heaven on a string, right? But he didn't. (laughs) Yeah, because what he did instead, he came to live among us, um, be in our culture, you know what I mean? Learn our language, all these things like this. And so that is him making the effort to meet people where they are. And you see that over and over in the gospels, meeting everybody where they are and then reaching them. And so a lot of times we're expecting for people to come to where we're at. And we do that in apologetics as well, you know? And I think that if we're waiting for them to come where we're at, we're, we might be waiting forever. And so getting kind of your feet wet, getting engaged and really entering into the culture, understanding the language of the culture, you know, all those things like a good missionary is what we still need to do here, even with our neighbors. So I'm a pastor, I'm a leader, I'm a, um, a, a person listening to this, and I go, okay, I hear you. I need to engage culture a little bit better, but I don't know where to start and I don't know how to do it. Yeah. Is there is there anything that you could say to that person who's listening right now to say, hey, listen, I know I know your church is maybe struggling. I know you feel like pressure to reach people, but here are some things that you could do as a Christian leader, pastor right now that would help you to start to learn maybe some things that are going on culturally. Yeah, no, that, that's a great question too. And there are things you can say, you can pick up some books and understanding like millennials and, you know, people like, for example, millennials, um, they tend to reject like organizations and stuff like this. And and so that's part of the reason too, why the church is declining among millennials as well too, because they'll still tell you in statistics, they say they still believe in God, you know what I mean? But they um, don't like the institution of church, you know? And so that's just something to kind of be aware of too. How do I yeah. wade into the kiddie pool, into culture? You know, I'm a pastor, and I mean, right. let's face it, a lot of Christians are sheltered. They live yeah. in their little bubble, you know, and all they do is think, oh my gosh, the world's terrible, and they yeah. sort of hide away. You know, sure. how, how does somebody go, okay, well, maybe I need to open up the front door and put yeah. my toe in the kiddie pool? Yeah. How, how does somebody do that? Yeah, part of it, I think, is being the salt and the light, right? Okay. That's our kind of starting point, right? Because the salt is going to preserve. Um, you know, that the goodness of God, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? And then we see, but we have to be in the culture as well too. So we have to be engaged in the culture, but also not um, be like culture all yeah. the way, you know what I mean? With their values and stuff like that. But I'd say when it comes to um, trying to like, where do you start, right? I think it's really important to talk to people and ask them like, is what I'm saying, is it making sense? Why or why not? And really having a lot of one-on-one conversations mm-hmm. is how you actually understand where people are coming from. Because sure. a lot of people just want to read it in a book But I'm like, no, don't read the books. You know what I mean? Um, At that point, you know, just go talk to people first, see where they're coming from, and then try to see if you can adjust the gospel message to be able to meet meet them where they are. Okay, so if I'm a pastor um, and and I wanna reach people and we know people are going away, um, what would you say someone should do? Like, you know, I, I always say, 
start at your front door. If people don't feel welcome at your front door, it don't make a difference what you do because they're probably going to. Are there, are there some things that you, you know, obviously you're not pastoring, but, right. but, you, but you go to church, you, you talk about Christianity, you look at culture. Is there anything that you think the church could be doing differently? Like, you know, you just said millennials don't like organization. Yeah. Okay, what are some things we can do as a church? You know, somebody's trying to grow their church. They're they're trying to reach people. Um, what are some things you would say to them? Hey, I think if you could try some of these things, you might find that you would start reaching people that are not Christians, that are far from God. Yeah, Anything 100%. in particular? Yeah, I, I notice a tendency among older generations to be kind of more polished, if that makes sense. Okay. So uh, I think like, especially for millennials um, and younger, you want to be authentic. You want to be just straightforward, honest, and authentic because when we see like some of these older people that are telling us like, you know, you need to look good all the time and all those sorts uh-huh. of things, we don't really like it. You know what I mean? Um, okay. Because that's how um, the younger generations are. So being authentic, honest, don't try to make everything look beyond perfect because they can see through that anyway. You know, so I'd say just first, I think just being real and honest about, you know, just how Christianity is. Give a realistic expectation because what happens is when they see you live in um, this life that they think is overly polished and something. They'll be like, well, that's not for me. I could never be like that. You know what I mean? And that okay. kind of keeps them away. So, And, and, and true Christianity is um, is rubber meets the road. It's yes. meat and potatoes. I mean, it's yes. it's it, it, there's a real sense of like, you know, Romans 7 where Paul's like, well, things that I want to do, yeah. I don't always do. Yeah. And I mean, I think we all can, even as Christians, there's things that we, you know, Paul says, live by the Spirit so that you don't fulfill the desires of the flesh. And he's, yeah. he's aware that we have the tendency, even as Christians, even as followers yeah. of Christ, to do dumb things. D- what do you say? Because you know, there's there's a generation out there that would say, and that was a, an old commercial. Never let them see you sweat. It right. was this old yeah. commercial. Um, you've got people in the church, maybe a pastor or a leader, listening to this right now. That's like going, no, we don't want to be too vulnerable. We don't right. want to be too um, o- open and honest. Uh, what do you say to that? Yeah, I, I mean. I think when I read the Bible, it's really open and honest. It's right? raw. Isn't it? Yeah, it's raw. Yeah, because you're gonna see the the worst out of all these different people all the time and stuff too. You know, and um, yeah. So I think that I, I mean, you don't want to. My thought is this: you don't want to promote sin, right? So you sure. don't want to make it sound like, hey, this is cool. Hey, I'm feeling this way, but it's awesome. You know yeah, what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Something like that. You don't want to promote sin, but you do want to be honest about the struggles that you have and stuff too, yeah. because everybody can relate. And in order for people to feel comfortable in your church, they have to feel like they can relate to these people. They can see themselves as being part of this group. That's great. Um, there's something, though, freeing about being able to be honest about your situation. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, um, me being a pastor, I try my best to not say to the congregation, look at how well I do, look at how spiritual I am. Look at and, and 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 there may be areas in my life that I may be more mature than some others, but you know I think the commonality that we all share is in the struggle. Yeah. Because very few people have massive success. Yeah. M- most of us know what it means to fail. Most of us know what it means to feel not wanted. You know, uh, and and you're saying that a church that can tap into and and have a leader that can share their faults. Um, n- not in a way that promotes them to go do the same thing, but sure. is able to say, hey, listen, I've blown it here, and let me tell you the lessons. You're saying those types of messages, those types of um, upfront stuff will reach younger people better than, than, than the other stuff. Absolutely. And, and one way you can see this in culture is if you look maybe about 20, 30 years ago, mm-hmm. you'll notice there was a lot more of the academia, people talking to culture, and people were influenced more by academia. And today, if you'll notice, like you have somebody like um, Kim Kardashian posting about a sandwich she ate, that's going to get way more attention than William Lane Craig and something brilliant he said. You know what I mean? Because um, it, right now it's kind of from the culture on. And if you look at cryptocurrency, it's kind of similar, right? It's not these institutions and these um, you know kind of top people because that's how it used to be in the past. You know, mm. but millennials have grown to be distrusting of those systems. So if you can be eye to eye with your congregation, wash their feet. Know, like Jesus, then that's when you're you're going to connect with people the best. What makes that change? Why why the shunning of the institutions? Why yeah. are we? I mean, I, I, I I'm probably in that really weird generation because yeah. 
I'm 51. So I'm not quite understanding a Kim Kardashian sandwich, right. yeah. but I'm also not really to, ready to sell my soul to a corporate institution. Right. I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. in that, but, but, but it does seem that the younger generation is concerned about a sandwich from Kim Kardashian. Why is that the case? Can you, yeah. can you say to me why that, cause you're, you're more on that front line. Why is yeah. that, why is that so important? Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's probably other reasons that I'm not aware of, but um, for me, it kind of gets back to that kind of eye to eye thing because a lot of times people will use institutions and at least this is the perception among okay. millennials is people use institutions and power um, against them, right? Um, in order to oppress them in some sort of way or something. Okay. So it's kind of a distrust of that kind of power. And yeah, so if you have somebody that's eye to eye level with you, you know, then that that really, then you'll feel safer and you'll feel more okay with being Which honest. explains why they don't want to come to a denomination. That's right. I've read that they want to be part of something that's more organic feeling and more yeah. vision focused and more um, where they feel like they're doing something that's accomplishing something, not just believing something, yes. but doing something that's accomplishing a task. Um, right. So when you're dealing with culture, because that's what you deal with pretty much on YouTube, yep. um, how does the church, because I'm not sure we've done a very good job, how do we speak to cultural issues in a way that embraces both the truth of the gospel, but also the love of the gospel? Because what I find is, is that it almost seems like that, that that churches either are on the truth side, yeah, and there's hardly any grace or love, yeah, or they're on the grace and love side, and everything sort of goes, and there's no truth. That's right. How, how do we? Because I mean, we got to talk about issues, because if not, the world disciples everybody. That's right. Okay, so how do we talk about cultural issues in a world that is so divided, but do it? Because you seem to have found a a way to do that. Tell me how you do that. Tell okay. everybody who's listening how you do that. that that's a great question. I, I'd say, uh, and, and to be completely honest with you, some of it I kind of just intuitively kind of okay. understand, right? You know what I mean? So so I won't say that it's just as cut and clear as that. But um, yeah, for me, I think I, I really try to balance out kind of the truth and love, like how the scriptures read, right? Because I, I really do think from that perspective where I say, okay, you have the brutal truth here, but you also love your neighbor. And I think loving your neighbor a lot of the time means you want to communicate with them in a way that they can understand, right? And this mm -hmm. is the way communication works. I want whoever I'm talking to to understand what I meant to say with the words that I'm using too, you know what I mean? Because it's very easy to misunderstand, right? So for example, if you're um, really focusing a lot of this kind of political stuff and stuff like this a lot, is you can, it doesn't really matter what the truth is about your party, but as soon as you say that oh, I'm a Democrat or I'm a Republican or something, there's already all this baggage associated with it. And that can be a barrier to them hearing um, your gospel message all the time because they've already said, oh, okay, I know these kind of people. These Democrats are X, Y, Z. These Republicans are X, Y, Z, right? And so that can become a barrier to communication sometimes where they won't hear your main message. So for me, I want to um, be careful with those in the sense where I don't want to raise any unnecessary red flags. You see mm. what I mean? Because yeah. my goal is to get the gospel message across in a way they can understand. And sometimes... You know, um, sometimes truth will, you know, truth's inevitable, like them knowing they're a sinner is not essential. You know what I mean? They have to know that there's a sinner in order to need a savior. Sure. But a lot of the other stuff's just not essential. And so I think as Christians, we want to be cautious with, with a lot of that stuff sometimes too, because we want to make sure we're not making it harder for people to enter into Christianity. We want to make sure that, you know, we, we allow them to be, you know, have to actually come to a place where they can make a decision on Christ all alone. You, you just made a great point that we can make it difficult. I know in Acts 15, when they're at the Jerusalem Council and they're figuring all this stuff out, yeah. that they say, let's not make it, let's don't trouble the Gentiles. Right. You know, um, the yoke on their necks. Yes, you know, try not to. What are some areas that you feel, just as a Christian now, yeah. forget being, you know, John McRae, YouTuber, yeah. what do you mean? Yeah. Um, as a Christian, what are some obstacles that you feel like the church is placing in front of the world yeah. getting to the gospel? Yeah. Um, Honestly, I think one of the bigger things is is works. I think a mm. lot of times we we preach works as a way we're going to say if you want to be a Christian, you know, you have to do X, Y, Z, and all these certain things. You know, mm -hmm. but we know from like Ephesians two eight and nine, Romans eleven six. I mean, there's countless passages where we are we're what we're given. We're given a free gift of grace, and so when we try to, it's just like in Acts fifteen when at the Jerusalem Council, he's like, don't punt the yoke. Uh, on their necks that, you know what I mean, that our ancestors had to endure or mm. whatever, you know, because that's the problem is we want to put yokes on people's necks all the time in order to get them saved. 
But I think it's pretty simple if you go to Acts 16, 30 and 31. Um, that when the Philippian jailer says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And he says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you and your house will be saved. You know, we start there. Then, you know mm. what I mean? We start following up with like, you know, Christian living, how to live as a Christian in this society and stuff. And that's what the New Testament's a lot on. So we got works that are obstacles. What else do you think? Like we kind of mentioned a little bit ago was politics too. So, so I'm going to ask you a, a very blunt question sure. and, and I want you to, to, to just shoot at it as straight as you can. I have pretty much stayed away from the political fray. In other words, I don't really, I, I don't do um, voter guides. I don't do, um, you know, let me tell you how I think you ought to vote. Right. I don't do the, let me, <laughs> let me, let me smuggle in a candidate, you know, with a sermon right. or any stuff like that. And I got a lot of buddies and friends that have weighed in massively saying you have to be political you have to talk about these issues you have to confront this stuff with truth um and i'm okay if you say hey chip i think you're wrong um I, I'm, I'm curious though because i think all pastors whether they want to admit it or not they they they, they want to know how to sort of navigate this yeah. this what do you see i mean because you're on the front line in so many ways with atheists and non-believers and agnostics and people like that, what would you say to pastors and leaders that are going, okay, you know what, finally, somebody's going to be honest here and, yeah. and broach this subject. Yeah. I'm all ears. What would you say? Yeah, I think it's really your decision, I think, is going to be based on your end goal, right? So okay. if your end goal is going to be um, for them to understand and accept the gospel, sometimes, like statistically speaking, you can say a lot of people were turned off of Christianity because they thought that it was synonymous with the Republican Party, right? Okay. And so statistically, you can see that's led to a decrease of people's interest in Christianity because of that. So if that's an obstacle, is that obstacle necessary? But many of those yeah. people would say, well, all we're doing is we're weeding out the the non-Christians, you know, yeah. because you, to, you have to vote this way to be a Christian. Right, what right. do you say to that? Yeah, I, I'd say that I think it, I, what I think is a big problem in in Christian thought a lot of the time is you can agree on the same issue. Like all Christians believe abortion is wrong, right? Uh, for the most part, you know what I mean? Um, but the thing is like, if you're not willing to have the discussion with how that's done, or even if somebody doesn't believe it's wrong, like instead of shunning them, having the conversation to understand first where they're coming from, then help them understand it can go a long way, right? Okay. And so a lot of the times, if you're only preaching to the choir, you know what I mean? Then your people aren't growing and you're not growing either because you're only getting a bunch of applauses from people. And I found that I grow the most by talking with people who think differently than me. And like me and my best friend, we disagree on a ton and we argue about everything, you know? But mm -hmm. it's helped me grow spiritually. It's helped me um, get more engaged and more excited about going through passages and stuff mm -hmm. together, you know, those sorts of things because there's disagreement. So I think it's healthy for there to be disagreement, but I don't think that you want to be petty with your disagreements, like those unnecessary quarrels like Paul talks about in, in First Timothy and, you know, those yeah. other places. So um, I think that um, if as soon as you start making Christianity synonymous with a uh, political party, you've already left, I think, what the the base biblical basics are because if you remember jesus too with the herodians and the sadducees were saying hey should we pay um tax to caesar you know and that put jesus in a really tough spot because um if he said don't pay taxes he'd be seen like the zealots and if he said do pay taxes he looked like a compromiser you know what i mean and so i try to think how jesus thinks <laughs> i try <laughs> but i yeah. try to think like how he i said how would jesus handle these situations a lot of time people are demanding him to take one side and he's pointing them to something bigger. And that's what I try to do a lot. He's saying, no, my kingdom is not of this world. You know what I mean? And so mm -hmm. that's how I tend to try to think about these situations a lot as well. Does your experience teach you that the church being more political and talking more about political things turns more people away or does it help grow the church? I, I would say, I think about it this way. At the end of my life, say I get hit by a bus tomorrow, God forbid, <laughs> but let's just say, what do I want people to remember about me? I, am I talking more about politics, you know what I mean? And I'll have my political bumper stickers and stuff and they say, oh, I remember him, he was a Democrat or Republican or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Or do I want them to say, no, the, what he talked about over and over was the love of Jesus Christ and the grace that we get from Jesus Christ, right? That's how I think of it. So I think when it comes to um, 
is it more helpful or more hurtful? I, I would probably venture to say that even statistically, like we said, it's, it's more harmful in ways too, you know, but I'd say for me, it's like the whole kind of focus there should be on what do you want people to remember at the end of your life, that you were just a political person or that you were a Christian primarily? What do you talk more about? What do you share more about? You know what I mean? And um, if you merge them, then I think that's where it becomes a problem when you make them synonymous. I think we need to give our brothers and sisters room to even have the conversation if you want to persuade them instead of just demonizing them. Yeah, I think, do you, do you agree with this? I think a lot of Christians, um, pastors, even friends that I have that I know love God and are good people, um, I feel like that they have, that they've done the, they, they do the, this is not a Democrat or Republican thing. This is a truth thing. Yeah. But then right after that, it becomes, but you can't vote this way yeah. and you can't do this, which really means it really was, to somebody who's not a Christian, yeah. it really was about the political thing. That's right, yeah. So what do you say to a pastor who's in the trenches and, I mean, yeah. they're just, I mean, they're all in politically yeah. and, 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 and they've got people on Facebook, they've got people on Instagram that are saying, yeah. you're going too far, you're, you're, you, you need to really back up. And they're like, no, I don't, this is the truth. That's this right. is the way it is. What do you say to somebody like that? I'd say, uh, so one thing that's common about everybody is everybody thinks they're right, right? And if they, <laughs> if they think they're wrong, they'll change their mind and then they think they're right again. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. So, so everybody thinks they're right. And so for me, I think, how can I best love my neighbor, right? And so if I'm passionate about something like politically or something like that, I could go on my YouTube channel and just rant about the other side or whatever, you know, but is that really helpful? Is that really helping me love um, the pe- the flock that God's entrusted me with? And does that really help me love my neighbor? You know what and I mean? That's a great point. Yeah. yeah. So you're, you're filtering everything through before I speak, before I talk, is this really loving my neighbor? But of course, the, the, the kickback's going to be, but you're not really loving your neighbor if you don't tell them the truth. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I'd say it depends on what it is. I mean, it's just like in your, your marriage, right? Like, if your wife says, honey, do I look fat in this dress? And if you're thinking yes, and you decide to tell them the truth, is, is I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean? Tell them the truth isn't always the loving thing to do because a lot of times we can use the truth not as a way to persuade, but as a way to punish people. You know what I mean? And so, so uh, we all have that kind of thing inside of us that wants to punish the other people, you know, make them look really bad. And so they're like, yeah, get them, John. You know, tell them they're wrong, you know? Mm-hmm. But um if I, I, my goal is to try to be persuasive, you know, to try to lead them to the gospel, just like Paul was in Acts 17, right? I would say I would say it's always good to tell the truth. I would say it's probably though we need to be selective as to how we actually yes. say it. Yes, um, I, I know using the marriage analogy, I used to tell, tell couples all the time, it's not what you just said. Yeah, it's how you said it. Agreed. Yeah, you know, and I do think there's time and place. Yeah, not every time and every place is the place to take the Bible bullet gun out yeah. and shoot people. Th- there may not be a playbook here. Yeah. It may be in the moment we're having yeah. to make these decisions, but I-, I would say that if you don't have some restraint, right, it- it is to- it- you feel like you always have to be on point, yeah. letting the fire go, um, you're probably marginalizing some people by doing that. Yeah. By not taking some time, you 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 love a passage in James. You you oh, yeah. seem to quote it all the time oh, yeah. about being very 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 slow to talk and very quick to listen. How, how does that how's that influenced you as a Christian apologist? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. That's a good question. I I tend to try. I spend a lot of time thinking through what I'm going to say on videos before I say them. Right? Because okay. I want to consider. Um, we all have these selfish needs a lot of the time too. You know what I mean? And so I want to make sure I do a lot of prayer. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I have sinful habits, you know what I mean? Where it's like, I want to get naturally, I just want to get more glory for myself. Mm-hmm. And so every single time before I record a video, I pray, you know what I mean? That God, I said, make it less of me, more of you, you know what I mean? And help me not to take whatever success I have to my head, you know what I mean? Those sorts of things, because mm-hmm. we all battle with these different things. Mm-hmm. And so I, I try to be careful with that. But um, when it comes to being slow to speak, quick to listen, um, you know, I think that's so important because we don't take that seriously mm. enough a lot. You know what I mean? Because we'll just, it, like telling the truth sometimes is just the easiest thing, right? Just to give them the blunt truth. You know what I mean? You're wrong. You know what I mean? You guys are bad, you know, whatever. That's the easiest thing to do sometimes. But to love my neighbor, I want to go the extra mile. So I want to say, how can I communicate this truth to them in a way that they'll be receptive to mm. that they can understand? And yes. that's not always being nice. You know what I mean? Sometimes it's being blunt. But the wisdom is really knowing when those times are. What do you think about um, 
social justice issues. We're, we're in a world right now where um, I believe the phrase is social justice warrior. You've, yeah. got, you've got that side. You've got another side that almost acts as if there's nothing to have any talk about. Right. Um, I've always found truth usually falls somewhere in between the fringes. Yeah. Um, how does, what is the church, what, what should we be doing with social justice issues? Yeah. You know, is there, is there a place for the church involved in that? Is the is it, you know, you got you go back to like the old reformers, they would say, just preach the gospel, man. Just preach the gospel, right, preach right. the gospel. Then you've got other people that are like, no, you can't get away from social justice issues because Jesus said we should, you know, yeah. feed the hungry. We should, we should go to the poor. We should clothe the naked. Like there's no way you can't be the hands and feet of Jesus and, and, and not follow Jesus. You have to do those things. Where do you think the church should be at on these social justice issues? Yeah, when it comes to social justice issues, what I realize is that to me, it looks like everybody is doing something very similar to the people that they criticize, right? And the reason <laughs> why is because um, it's kind of this is kind of the problem in culture is when people believe that they're right and they're unwilling to have a dialogue with people who think differently, then what they're kind of doing is um, they're, they're just kind of shutting the other person down mm -hmm. and then they just demonize those, those other people and they do nothing to try to understand the other person, right? That's not good for society, you know what I mean? Because I think it's gotten so polarized where we say if they have any belief, it has to be wrong. Those other people, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you believe anything they believe, then you're just like them. You're on the outside, you know, you otherize them. And then what that does is it prevents people from actually being able to have conversations because the truth is there are things that Republicans and Democrats both can agree on. And then they could have reasonable discussions about the best way to get that done. But a lot of the times we're, we're past those points with a lot of the social justice stuff. Are there any things, areas of social justice that you feel like Christians should be more involved in? Oh, yeah, in? yeah. Yeah, I, I, th here's the thing. Um, I think when, and, and this is my opinion, but I think when you really wrestle with the Bible, you, I can see how both sides get to their positions. They both can quote verses, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and I can see how they both can get there. Yep. And so I think biblically, when we try to be faithful um, to God's word and we try to love our neighbors, how we're commanded and stuff, we are going to run into these areas where it doesn't fit so nice and neat into one party. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Because I, when people ask me if I'm Democrat or Republican, I, I'm thinking on what issue? You know what I mean? Because there are some issues that I agree with uh, with this party and some issues I agree with the other party. You know what I mean? So it, it depends. But I want to try to make sure that my worldview is biblically based and I'm doing the best I can to love my neighbors. You know what I mean? And so I understand there's, there's these different sides, but I think in order for us as a church to actually grow and help the world be these disciples and this sort of thing too, we have to be willing to hear them first. You know what I mean? We yeah. want to understand before we demand for people to just understand us because that's the problem in culture people just want to be understood but no one wants to take the time to understand yeah i think this i think this yeah. exposes the divide that we have both sides are sometimes almost saying the same exact thing yeah. but they're just saying it from a different they're shouting it from a different right. um building yeah. did, didn't you have a phone call from two people that was like the exact did. opposite that you had to you had to almost say you're both saying the same thing yeah i did and, it, and it's been a while since i had that combo because okay. i remember i did write it down after i had them both okay. it was so ironic and i made a video out of it um somewhere around the time of January 6th. Like, okay. Um, but um, no, I, it was during the time where it was the insurrection time. Okay. And also this was following from 2020 with a lot of the George Floyd stuff, right? Okay. And I, it was so interesting because I heard people, um, uh, both the people I talked to, both argued that almost the identical way, but one of them, one of them was super um, far left and the other one was more far right. You know what I mean? But they said the exact same things, almost the same criteria besides one was pro-Trump and one was pro um, George Floyd, you know okay. what I mean, that situation. Yep. And, and so, yeah, so it was just really funny. Um, you have to watch the video for details because I can't remember all the details right now, but yeah. But they were, it was almost like, it, it wasn't it like, we're not being heard. Yeah. So, because we're not yes. being heard, yes. um, you know, we feel like we have to take this election thing into our own hands That's right. and do what we need to do. But yeah. yet, when the George Floyd thing was going on and some of the black communities saying we're not being heard, you know, it, 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 it's like, it's interesting because the commonality there is that there was destruction to to property, right. um, but the commonality was is that each group felt to some degree they had not been heard. That's right. And and so there is a truth to the fact that um, there are people in our country, whether it's on the right or the left, or whether it's black or white or whatever else, 
there are times that people don't feel heard. Yeah. And the Christian response is, we want to make sure people get heard, but we also want to say the 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 end result is let's don't go tear into the White House or let's go don't go destroy buildings. Right, but yeah. but, it, but but it's it's interesting how you know you can have two people almost saying the exact same thing yeah. with almost the exact same outcome, and neither one of them would even discuss the other's position because there's just such a divide. Hundred percent, and that's why I said it seems like in culture, I think this is a product of the individualism and the postmodernism in culture is that everybody wants to say, I'm right, you're wrong, don't talk to me, right? Like, mm. you, you, it's important that it's like, if you're gonna say anything about my position, you have to validate it. If not, then you're the enemy, you know what I mean? And so that kind of mindset, I think, is kind of what what I see going on on the bigger scale when it comes to a lot of the political stuff and all too, you know, is that there's this kind of defensiveness because they feel like they're losing part of themselves if, if they concede anything you said, you know what I mean? Mm. But in reality, I think they'd have way more to agree on than they think, they just, See, it's very tribal. But isn't but isn't isn't there something I mean about the gospel that we lay down things yes. rather than fight for? You know, 100%. and that's that's always tough because I, you know, people at church will always say, no, we we know we have to fight for this. Yeah, and I'm like going, well, I don't know that we have to fight for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not I'm not sure. You know, yeah. uh, um, I had a situation where somebody said, but don't you think I need to fight for? And I'm like, well, I think as a Christian, you need to love. Yeah, yeah. I'm not yeah. sure that fight's the right word. Right, Love right. is the right word. You know, the, the the act of resistance that we give as Christians is not a violent resistance. It is a loving resistance. Yeah. Jesus never called anybody to be a pacifist. Right, he didn't right. say, yeah. don't do anything in the face right. of evil. He just yeah. said, don't resist it with violence. That's right. We resist it in love. Right, we right. give, we serve, we lay down. Um, what would you say to, uh, um, you know, people that are in ministry today um, how do they how do they handle the atheistic part of stuff? I mean, you you may you you may feel differently about what's going on with atheism, I, and and I and I can't and I'm surely not um, a scholar on this by any stretch of the imagination, um, nor am I you know professionally trained on this, but it does feel there is a lot of deconstruction going on. In people's faith, and that may just be an over, it may be like a magnifying glass that makes it look like there's more, right, you know. Right. Um, but it feels that way as a pastor that people I know have left the faith, have deconstructed the faith, and many of them have found stuff online. They found people to watch online. Um, what do we do with that? How do we handle that? Yeah, you that, send them to your channel. Yeah, yeah, all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I think um, what I realized too, so coming in from an apologetic background where a lot of the information you learn is really academic, right? Okay. Um, so a lot of the arguments for God's existence and stuff are really academic and the responses are you follow the laws of logic, you know, you learn logical fallacies, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And then, so I started from that background um, and then I came into YouTube and there were fallacies everywhere on the atheist side, right? And you'd see the, the um, Christian responses would um, be more following the logical train, you know, because this is how they were trained, right? And so what I realized at a certain point was I said, okay, why are these arguments persuasive, right? And what I found is that most of the time, most of the atheist arguments the, for the channels that do well, at mm -hmm. least, they're using a lot of emotional arguments, you know, because a lot of it is emotions that people can identify with. Because I think most of us can identify with feeling judged at church or feeling like we're not good enough, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And, and those sorts of things. And if these things lead to their deconstruction, then the atheists already have some common ground with them where we don't as much, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Because they, you know, because they see themselves, they felt otherized, you know what I mean? So it's kind of like the, you know, the rebels, you know what I mean? They're like over there. So I think a lot of that, I think a lot of the internet atheism today too is driven on a lot of the same premises that culture grants as well and a lot of postmodernism mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And that really helps for the atheist to be more persuasive. So I think that um, this is where I saw a big need too, is I said, okay, well, we need to be able to respond to them in ways that they're gonna understand. It's not that mm -hmm. you validate necessarily those those faulty axioms that they have, the, the beliefs that they build their um, worldview on, mm -hmm. but instead you can avoid some of them and use some of those beliefs to show them the error in their worldview. You know, okay. So that's where I'm, I'm always thinking in terms like that. You, you don't wanna unnecessarily create a block where you don't have to, you know what I mean? You kind of, I think of it as building up, you know, wait for the your kind of power knockdown in that sense. Yeah, well, I mean, but what you just said there applies even back to the conversation we were having about politics and whatever else. It's it's getting to know somebody, yeah. letting them know that you care, yeah. letting them know that you're not there just to give them a hard time. Yeah. And then when honest dialogue can happen, 
th- there's a chance that there might be some reasoning. It's yeah. but when it's just a full on attack from the get go, it's it's hard to go. What are things that you find are persuasive as things to say to someone who is an atheist? Like if a pastor or a leader or Christians listening to this right now and they're going, you know, I got some people in my church that are really seriously thinking about deconstructing. Yeah. What what are some things that you could say, hey, you might be able to talk to them about this in this sort of way? Are there anything that come to your mind? Yeah, I, I mean, I would think that, so when it comes to your one-on-one interactions mm-hmm. with people too, that's always going to be handled a little differently than it is on YouTube. Sure. Too, right? So I'd say that um, asking them questions, making them feel heard, because if you look at the deconversion statistics and stuff, people often left. It was kind of a last resort where they felt or at the end of it, they've had these intellectual doubts, they've had these kind of emotional doubts, and then the church would push them away a lot for it, and then the atheists were there with open arms. You know what I mean? So that's why they came in and felt like they were um, falling into that fold. So mm. I think that it's not very loving always for us to not try to make an effort in order to um, understand where they're coming from, communicate effectively. You want to understand um, where they're coming from and why they're saying what they're saying. Because a lot of the time, it's not the thing. You know, if they say, oh, well, you know, I can't think of how God can be, you know, all powerful and also, um, you know, all knowing at the same time or whatever. That was probably not it. You know what I mean? There's probably, that could be a leaf on a tree, but it's not the, the you know, the the trunk of the tree. I gotcha. Yeah. What do you, what do you, are there any things out there that you go, these are the two, three, eight, things that really are problematic for non-Christians or people who've deconverted or for atheists? Is there in, are there some real stumbling blocks that you go, these are the top three or the top five, or is it just, is it a grab bag? No, I think, I'd say most of their objections always are going to be based around um, God is mean, Christians are mean, um, or they're, yeah, or immoral. I, I mean, that's like majority of their objections come down to that. And those call Christians dishonest, like any Christian apologist, to be like, oh, he's dishonest, he's a liar, he's this and that, because they may have felt lied to for believing Christianity early, then they came to believe for whatever reason, you know, Christianity might be true, but they project that onto all, all Christians a lot of the time, you know? And so I think that that's, the, the, you'll, at least when it comes to today's atheism, if everything seems like to be centered around those those sorts of things as well, too. So it's the the rhetoric, you know, things that just sound kind of witty, but don't have too much substance when you really mm-hmm. think harder about them. Mm-hmm. They sound intuitive. And then you'll have a lot of the moral objections. So those are the two things I think are. What do you, what do you say to an atheist or someone who's, you know, searching for their faith? They go, you know, well, Christians are mean or God's yeah. mean. The Old Testament, you know, God's killing everybody. What, what, do you have any responses that you? Yeah, I, I typically don't have any cookie cutter responses okay. because I, I want to understand the visual, the individual, why they're saying what they're saying. So I ask questions. Why is that? You know what I mean? And typically, um, like the, the right answer to that is, okay, we don't base our Christianity off of the faults of individuals, you know what I mean? But we base mm-hmm. it on the life of Christ, you know what I mean? And That's he was point. the perfect man who was loving, you know what I mean? And, and all these things are really contrast that. So that way they can understand that they may reject some Christians, but they don't have to reject Christianity or the gospel message um, because of that. How do we get the gospel into the culture? Well, I'll tell you one, one way that I think about it is I think about what are the main things people have to know in order to understand the gospel, right? They have to obviously believe that there's a God, right? Okay. You know, they have to believe that they're sinners and need a savior, you know, and they have to believe that Jesus was the savior, mm. the perfect sacrifice because we couldn't be perfect, those sorts of things. And then I try to think about them from the culture's perspective. Where are they going to object to this? You know what I mean? Do they believe there's a God? And if not, why do they not believe there's a God? And try to make adjustments to get them to understand that point. And so you want to, in my mind, I lay out the gospel in about six different um, premises. And I try to see where am I going to get obstacles from culture? And then mm-hmm. based off of what I've learned from talking with so many different people and also from reading statistics and views and stuff like that, where I need to, or where I'm going to have more trouble, on which points am I going to have more trouble on than others? And I think one of the biggest points, I think, is the fact that we're all sinners. Um, we tend to, in, in our culture today, we tend to not think there's, uh, we're sinners. We're, there's nothing wrong with us. We don't okay. need a savior. So I try to come at that from a bunch of different angles on my channel and stuff to try to get them to understand that they actually still do need a savior. Okay. Um, another question that I have for you. Sure. Um, how, how do we, as believers, in your opinion, how do we best go at evangelizing the lost yeah how like how, you know 
if if you if you were to say to me, Chip, I really think if the church would do this a little bit differently, we would have a better success rate. Any any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I'll try not to make this too complicated, but uh, me and um, my best friend, we've been working on this kind of model for understanding communication for the last couple of years. Mm. And we kind of break people down in about three different categories who want different things, right? So uh, category number one are people who tend to appeal more to, to tradition and authority and kind of a little bit more kind of tribal, but what the authority says kind of goes. You see what I mean? And okay. so that's what they take to be evidence is okay. what the authority says, right? Okay. And so um, you could say maybe like the Catholic Church could be an example of this. And, you know, there's plenty of different examples. Sure. Right? Um, and a lot of times, too, those the preachers that preach out of these will just quote scripture at people on the street, right? Because they, that's convincing to them, so they think it's convincing to everybody else, right? Mm -hmm. So they'll shout scriptures. Um, the second group, um, group two, they're kind of more like the science kind of bent, you know, logic okay. and science. And so they say, what counts as evidence? Has it been tested by the historical method? Is it logically consistent? That sort of thing, right? They're probably more of the minority in today's culture, in my opinion. Mm. And then the third group will, things that they take to be evidence is from their experience and from um, how they feel inside. They look okay. internal, right? And so understanding, and what's funny about this is all three groups, they think that their way is obviously the best way, right? It's yeah. obviously the right way. Yeah. But in reality, we have different people who are persuaded by different things. And so understanding um, even like simple categories like that, where these people are coming from, what they take as evidence really helps to dictate the approach because it's not a one size fits all for everybody that you're going to talk to. That's great. So yeah, yeah, you're, what you're saying is is trying to size up what's in front of you yeah. and how they're going to process information. That's right. And then delivering that information in a way that's easier. That's sort of like the the, the disc profile enneagrams. It's learning yeah. to deal with people's personality yeah, and, right. and speaking that way. So you're finding that. Um, churches or apologists or people who are doing cultural stuff, if you're getting a pretty good read on how that person processes yes. and you deliver the goods in that process, there is a much higher chance of of persuasion. That's right, because they will count that as evidence. Other things they won't. So for example, huh, my natural state is that third category where my natural state, um, I, just, I come to look inside to see how I feel and uh, you know what I mean okay. and those sorts of things. But like the first category, the authorities, when they say something, I wouldn't naturally, I don't find that persuasive at all. You know okay. what I mean? But I think as Christians, we take everything in holistically, right? So we're full humans. We have emotions. We need community and authority. Mm -hmm. You know, we um, and we need um, to think intellectually, logic. We need to be convinced in our own minds, you know? So those sorts of things all matter. As a Christian, we're whole people. And too often we treat people as if they're just one thing. They're purely intellectual or they're gotcha. purely emotional or they're purely authority bent, you know what I mean? So those are the type of things I think of. And so I want to give everybody everything, but you want to first meet them where they're at so then they can see a need to expand into understanding why they need authority and why or why they need science and logic and, you know. Totally off subject question. Yeah. How, what was the sort of the, the impetus for calling it, what do you mean? Oh yeah. So when I initially started my channel, uh -huh. I was responding to a lot of atheist memes Right, so that's why. Oh, okay. Yeah, so the memes were really popular um, a few years back on Facebook and stuff. I see all these memes, and I'm like, man, I, I want to respond to that. You know what I mean? But it's hard to do sometimes in like you know one sentence or something. So I just started making videos based off of that. So what's the thing you've learned the most being on YouTube? Really realizing how easy it can be to get off track. Okay. And, and the reason I say that is because you can see these crowds. It's easy to kind of go along with the crowds and say things that you know they're gonna agree with, you know what I mean? And it's easy to kind of fit in in that sense, but there's, I mean, really trying to stay true biblically um, is more of a challenge because you're gonna okay. tick off people. You're gotcha. even gonna tick off a lot of your own subscribers and stuff, you know what I mean? So um, really kind of learning to really kind of humble yourself a lot, you know what I mean? And, and not be too attached to the outcomes on, on YouTube, I think is, is pretty important. So somebody tuning in here, they tuned in because they really like John McRae. They like the way you deliver what you do yeah. and whatever. What's a couple of things about John McRae that nobody knows that oh. we can that we can for, to, to have the world reveal here that yeah. uh, people don't know about you? Yeah, um, I'm not a YouTuber. I'm a human. <laughs> so it's like so people think I, they tend to be like, oh, he's that's this funny. guy who's always nice and patient or something like that. No, that's me. You know, when I'm you know recording and scripting and stuff or whatever. You know. But so I have just as many issues as everybody else, you know what I mean? Um, but I, I, I'd i say that um, I have 
negative traits too. Like I have a tendency sometimes to want to be unique, want to be, um, don't want anybody else to do what I'm doing and stuff like this, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and so I have to remind myself over and over that this is about the gospel message. I have to keep, because every now and then I'll, I'll um, you know, kind of lose grounding a little bit mm. and I have to keep grounding myself too. So there's that. And there's also um, um, early on in my YouTube days for the first year or two or something, I would get, take comments personal, you know what I mean? Like mm. sometimes, because nobody likes their art criticized, you know what I mean? Sure. And people will always misunderstand you too on YouTube. They'll always be like, oh, you know, this is so dumb because whatever. And they didn't really understand what you said. You have this tendency to want to defend yourself all the time, right? Um, that was a thing I worked through a lot though, because I had to go back and I say, okay, what am I defending here? Am I defending my ego or am I defending the gospel? Mm -hmm. And almost every time it's, it's the ego, you know what I mean? So okay. I said, so I kind of went through and said, why am I so attached to this? I'm getting too much of my value from this. And I have to remember that my ultimate value is in Christ and what he did and who he says I am, not what these mm -hmm. random people online right. say who I am. So, yeah, so that's something I went over over and over and over in my head to help ground me into a better mind state when it comes to why I'm doing what I'm doing. You have to remind yourself all the time because the flesh is sneaky. So, yeah. What's one thing, if you could say to a pastor or a leader out there, a Christian out there that's just sort of struggling, trying to make things work and whatever, what's, what's a word of encouragement that you could give to them? It seems hard, <laughs> and it is hard. You know what I mean? But the thing is, too, is like, um, as long as you're not basing your self-value and worth based off of what you do, mm. but instead in who Christ okay. says you are, it, it's going to be a lot easier for you because um, it's too, it's really easy to get all of our value from anything besides God. We do it naturally. You know, it doesn't take much convincing, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't matter even if it's something good like pastoring, you know, we sure. can say, okay, I'm valuable because I'm a pastor and I'm valuable because I have all the answers or this and that. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, where I'm a good person, mm -hmm. there's going to come a time where you don't have all the answers, you fail, you know what I mean? And all these things. And so if you build everything based on that foundation of you and your value, it's going to be way harder for you to deal with anything when these storms come. So what are your thoughts? It's a big issue today. Racism is everywhere. Yeah. It's all over the place. Speak into that. Help, you know, whether it's a white pastor or a black pastor, whoever's out there, what, what do you say to them about how to deal with this stuff? How do we deal yeah. with this? Yeah, I, I'd say, honestly, I think really being slow to just be defensive and just know what you're going to say, you know, have some mm -hmm. sort of gut reaction, because that's what kind of hurts. Because I know I have a lot of um, black Christian friends who don't agree with a lot of the the ways that they feel that racism is being brushed off. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so for them, it's, it's super offensive and they're hurt, but they feel like they can't even say anything to mm -hmm. their pastor because their pastor is just going to write them off and yell at them. And you know what I mean? And same with other Christians, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think we want to be people that are approachable, you know what okay. I mean? That people can talk to. Because I think listening and talking, uh, listening is more valuable than talking. You know what I mean? You want to be slow to speak again, yes. and quick to listen. One mouth, two ears. Yeah, that's right. That's what God gave us. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I just want to say thanks so much for stopping by, um, hanging out here. Um, really appreciate your ministry. Appreciate you being being on the uh, podcast. And uh, um, we'll uh, hopefully at another point, another time, we'll have some more time to sit down and talk. Absolutely, man. And it's been a blessing. I appreciate, you know, um, you taking care of me while I'm out here too. So yeah. appreciate it, man. It's been, it's been great, man. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much. Well, thanks so much for uh, taking time to hang out with us and uh, listening to this, hope this is um, of some benefit to you if you're a pastor, a leader, a Christian out there in the in the trenches doing whatever you're doing. But uh, just remember, we are here to reach the next generation. Hey, Chip here. I just wanna take a moment and say thanks so much for, for watching Reaching the Next Generation. Um, I really hope that this was something that was beneficial to you. And what I would ask, if you really enjoyed this, would you like it? Would you subscribe to it? Would you give us some comments? And most importantly, would you share it? Um, I believe with all of my heart that the material and the content that we have on this channel truly can make a difference and resource pastors and leaders and Christians. And you can help us to truly help others to reach the next generation. Thanks so much for being a part of our channel.